You may well have played at least one game that features the almighty Kunio Kun, that legendarily hot blooded high school tough, somebody who seems to spend almost no time studying and instead is either going around punching and kicking his rivals because they've bullied or otherwise warned one of his friends, or taking part in an extracurricular activity such as dodgeball or football that turns out to be equally as violent. Kunio, a character initially created by Yoshihisa Kishimoto as a semi-autobiographical bad kid that reflected his own misspent youth, would eventually become the mascot of original developers Technos Japan through most of the studio's lifetime. His very first game essentially created the blueprint for the most successful years of the beat-em-up genre. Other colossally loved games included River City Ransom and Super Dodgeball, and the world of Kunio still carries on today beyond the original Technos titles, thanks to the likes of River City Girls. Having done the original Kunio Kun, or Renegade as it's known over here, in the past, I wanted to do another video covering this thoroughly awesome character, but this is about a specific subset of his games. The funny thing about the Kunio Kun games, and there's a lot of them, is that there's probably more sports games than there are actual beat em ups, which is kind of amusing considering that fighting is where the series originated from. While most people probably know the likes of Super Dodgeball and Nintendo World Cup, there's way more than that even just from the life of Technos Japan, which is the period that we'll be covering, and they certainly aren't anything like your traditional sports game, coming with a much more physical and suitably Kunio-esque spin, and not a whole lot in the way of rules. These games often come with quite a lot of humour, they all fit somewhere in the rather complex world of Kunio Kun lore, and a lot of them, most of these games never left Japan, are pretty good in the bargain. So here goes nothing. Today we're covering the Kunio Kun sports games from Technos Japan's lifetime, a list of 11 individual titles released between 1987 and 1996, including plenty of ports. Niketsu Koko Dodgeball Boo, more commonly known in the West as Super Dodgeball, was the second game in the entire Kunio Kun series, originally released in the arcades in late 1987. The lore here is pretty straightforward. After someone mysteriously KOs Kunio with a dodgeball, he decides that he's going to join Hot Blooded High's dodgeball team. First off, he'll defeat the team from rival high school Hanzono, led by Ricky, one of the main antagonists from the first game, and then he'll take the team around the world to take on various other practitioners of this playfully violent ball meets face sport. Of course, you don't get any of this in the Western version. Here, Kunio is simply an unnamed captain of a dodgeball team from Dallas, and you face Chicago in the first match, presumably the national finals, before the round the world trip begins. This is a pretty simple game, really. You get two buttons, one to pass and one to shoot. Each team has four players on the court and three on the sidelines, and the four court players must be eliminated via chucking the ball at their cranium. They all have energy bars, although a particularly powerful hit usually takes the smaller guys out in one go. It's a lot like a beat-em-up, only with a ball, really, and it's a whole lot of fun. Often the way to go in this game is to get as hard a throw as you can, usually by jumping and shooting when you're right at the apex of the jump, but a lot of the game's also about standing up to the opponent's shots, trying to catch them, and then throwing the ball right back at them before they recover. As you go through the teams, the ball's going to come at you a lot faster, and the CPU also has special shots at their disposal such as extra speedy shots, handing the ball in the air and aiming down at you, or lethal curves. These can be caught too, although you've got to be very good with your reactions to do so. Still, you'll have to learn that if you want to beat this game, because sometimes endless big shots just aren't enough against the best teams. You can duck shots in a pinch, and the surface you're playing on can also affect things, whether it's slippery ice or a dirt track where it's harder to get a run up on. The guys on the sidelines can also be rather useful. You can pass the ball around them and try to keep the opponent guessing as to when you're actually going to shoot. But of course, the opponents can do this too, so you're always on your toes. The hot-blooded team only ever consists of the much bigger Kunio and everyone else being normal sized, while the other teams… well, they just keep getting bigger and bigger, it has to be said. Super Dodgeball was quite a popular game, and it sets the stage for what to expect from a lot of these sports games. They're not very serious, and they're a straightforward blast to play whether you're against the computer or with a friend. 
Dodgeball in particular is a sport that just makes total sense for the Kunio Kun series as a whole, so it's no wonder that a lot of the sports titles connected to the series ended up being dodgeball related, whether it's the ones released by Technos or the games that were released after they'd gone bankrupt. It's also important to note that Super Dodgeball fully established the art style for the whole Kunio Kun series going forward. Whereas the characters in the original Niketsu Koha Kunio Kun were normally proportioned, it's only here in Super Dodgeball where they get the more super deformed big head style that would be seen in all of the other games in the series. The whole presentation and music is fine too. The soundtrack in particular is very catchy indeed, especially the song from the England stage which is a rather cheeky mashup of the Beatles songs Get Back and A Hard Day's Night. While there aren't exactly a whole lot of dodgeball games out there on the market, it's fair to say that this is the most famous one, and definitely the best of them. And naturally, it received quite a few ports. The straightest port of the original arcade can actually be found on the Sharp X68000, released in September of 1988. The X68000 is known for its accurate arcade ports, and this is no exception. There's not an awful lot of difference between this and the arcade, and there's even some subtle little improvements such as the addition of a bit of parallax scrolling. Still, the most famous port of the game is obviously the NES one. I'd imagine that, particularly in the West, most people would have originally played this game here in the home, rather than in the arcade. The NES game obviously has to make a few changes due to limitations. The characters are now all the same size, and there's now only three characters in the court. Still, the sideline characters are still there, meaning there's quite a lot of sprites on screen, enough that they will indeed flicker and disappear from time to time because the game's gone over the NES's sprite limit. Now of course, if you happen to be playing this on emulation, you could futz around with your settings a little and fix it so that they don't flicker at all, but despite this and the game being a little slower, the gameplay isn't actually affected all that badly. I find it's a lot easier to perform the special shots yourself on this version too, something which I've never quite been able to get the hang of when playing the original arcade, and there's also a fun little free for all beanball mode that makes for an amusing little distraction. Despite the technical limitations, this is still a pretty good version of the original game, although it is not quite the best version, it has to be said. The best version of the original Dodgeball Club in the home, and indeed probably the best version overall, can be found on the PC Engine. This version largely takes after the NES one, but it's an excellent souped up take on the title that, unfortunately, was never released outside of Japan, although it didn't come out until 1990. Also known as the Extra Edition, this version has the maximum four court players and brings back size differences, but the big change is that the game's speed is a lot smoother. Even the original arcade couldn't get over 30 frames, but this one goes all the way, and it definitely makes a difference. Other additions here include being able to fiddle around with your team a bit more and add the captains of the other teams into your squad once you've beaten them, meaning that you can actually improve your club, and there's an even wider range of special shots to be found. All this, and the core gameplay remains as engaging as ever. Most of the versions of this title are decent, but yeah, this is definitely the best, and by some distance. The only version I would say falls down somewhat is the Game Boy one, which was released in Japan in 1991 under the name Niketsu Koku Dodgeball Boo Koteki Dodge Soldier no Maki, or Fierce Rival Episode of the Dodge Soldiers. Unfortunately, the little handheld is perhaps that bit too weak to really handle dodgeball. The game's even slower here, and that makes controlling Kunio and the Gan very stiff. You end up running when you don't want to, and a regular match just ends up taking that bit too long. But while this one perhaps isn't worth bothering with, this is a very good game on every other platform, and easily the most celebrated of Kunio Kun's sporting escapades. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
After dodgeball, Kunio's most famous sports title is unquestionably Niketsu Koko Dodgeball Boo Sokahen, or Soccer Story. This one didn't make it to the arcades, but it was originally released on the Famicom in May 1990, with the Western release later in the year being localised as Nintendo World Cup. How did Kunio switch from dodgeball to footy, then? Well, here's the plot. While Kunio's busying himself with dodgeball practice, Niketsu High's soccer team goes to a sushi restaurant to celebrate qualifying for a tournament. However, they all get food poisoning. Misako, manager of the soccer team, persuades Kunio and his squad to help out and replace them in the championships, with the promise of a kiss for each of them if they win. Again, you don't get any of this in the Western version, you simply go up against various other national sides. Much like the dodgeball title, what we have here is a hybrid between sports and fighting. Only much more so here, seeing as the action gets a lot more intimate and there are no rules whatsoever in this version of soccer. Also, this differs a great deal from other football games in that you only play as one person on the team, that being Cuneo, and you give out directions to your teammates telling them to pass, tackle or shoot. You can even hand out instructions to them in the changing rooms before a game and at half time, although I have to be honest and say that I'm not sure how much of a difference they really make because even if this is quite different to the footy norm, it is still very simple and casual, in a good way. A lot of the enjoyment in Soccer Story comes from a couple of things, either kicking the crap out of the other team until they don't get up anymore, or trying to set up various spectacular goals. The key to the game is mastering Cuneo's special nutshot bicycle kick and diving headers, both of which are nearly certain to result in goals if you get them right. While this isn't exactly the hardest soccer game in the world once you get good at doing these things, it's still quite a lot of fun to pull the moves off. Nothing wrong with a simple soccer game if there's the prospect of scoring lots of magnificent goals, after all. This is a very fun little game indeed on the Famicom, although I would stress one thing. You're far better off playing the original Famicom version rather than the Western localization. Nintendo World Cup doesn't necessarily change the gameplay too much, the palette swaps of the characters certainly look worse although they're not overly objectionable, but there's one fatal mistake here. For some reason, when the game was localised, the time for each half was increased to 4 minutes from the original's 1 minute 30, and that timer moves pretty slow, meaning that half of football is actually closer to 7 real minutes. This is way, way too frickin' long. When the game's got shorter halves, it's just right, exactly as pacey as it should be, and it doesn't outstay its welcome. When the half is this long, well you may well have kicked the other team completely off the field by the time it gets to the finish, meaning that, well there's not much to do except score and score again, and it starts to get very old and boring. Simply due to this, I really can't recommend going for the Western version of the game at all. It only takes those little changes to completely screw up an otherwise fun and entertainingly casual soccer game. It's also important to note that while the original Famicom version, like Super Dodgeball, features different types of pitch depending on who you're facing, such as desert and snow, Nintendo World Cup does away with all of that and you just play on regular, boring old grass. So yeah. Us Western folk kinda got screwed with this one. Soccer Story received a hell of a lot of other ports away from the NES, and generally speaking, they perform very well. Once again we have a version of the game on the Sharp X68000 from October 1990. Much like all the ports of this game, there's not a whole lot of difference gameplay wise between this and the Famicom, but the graphics are a lot cleaner, the speed is much smoother, and the already catchy music's had a glow up. I guess you could say that this is what an arcade version of Soccer Story would have looked like, if one existed. The PC Engine gets two editions of the game, a regular Hue card one, as well as an enhanced CD version featuring voice acting and Red Book Audio. The core game is exactly the same on both releases, of course, the only noticeable change is that the camera is zoomed out compared to the NES, and this change is actually quite useful when it comes to setting up your big old bicycle kicks and so on. Mind you, it works pretty well either way to be honest.
the Mega Drive also got a version of the game. Officially released only in Japan, but often made available on bootleg and multi-game carts in other territories, this was the one time that Kunio-kun made his way to a Sega system. And again, it's totally fine. There's a couple of changes here. Like the PC Engine version of Dodgeball Club, this one's got a full frame rate, is a lot smoother, and that's welcoming, and you can now power Kunio and his team up by holding a button down, making use of the one extra button this version has compared to the two that all the others are stuck with. Powering up Kunio and unleashing a super shot is another way to score, although honestly, I prefer the simplicity of two buttons when it comes to this game, and I can't say I bother doing it all that much. Finally, the Game Boy gets a very good version of the game. This is based more on the World Cup release, only without the ridiculously long halves, and while this is zoomed in even further than the Famicom original, it plays way better than the Game Boy version of Dodgeball Club. The controls are much easier to get to grips with. What other sports are Kunio and the boys good at, then? Well, next up we have a good old-fashioned athletic meet, albeit one with a thoroughly Kunio-appropriate twist. This is Downtown Niketsu Koshinkoku Soyuke Daidokai, although we can just call it Downtown Niketsu March Super Awesome Field Day. First released in October of 1990, this one didn't leave Japan and came out on the Famicom, Game Boy and the PC Engine CD, with that version ported over by Naxat. Now, before you start writing a comment, there's a second athletics game that came out outside of Japan, which we will get to in a bit. This is the first Kunio sports game to be included in the Downtown subsection of the Kunio-kun series. These titles mostly take place outside of the trappings of Niketsu High and in the town surrounding it, and this line of games started with the almighty Downtown Niketsu Story, the title that most Westerners know as River City Ransom, or um, Street Gangs if you're European. The law here is that Kunio is challenged to put together a team to take part in an athletic meet organised by Todo, the foley arrogant student council president of Riho Academy, a much preppier private school for rich kids that looks down their nose at the hot-blooded slum dogs that Kunio and company represent. While age-old rival Ricky teamed up with Kunio during the events of Downtown Niketsu's story, he'll also be in friendlier competition against you at the head of Hanzon Ohai. Now I have to admit that I'm pretty bad at this one, at least on the Famicom. I have tried, but perhaps I'm just too focused on getting first rather than beating on everyone as well, which is kind of what you're supposed to do. It's tougher when they're all running. Still, I was able to use a cheaty little exploit on the cross-country event. If you spam throwing a weapon against the wall, you get 5 points each time you pick it back up. So naturally I did this so I could move on. Anyway, Downtown Niketsu March consists of only four events, but they're all somewhat bulky. There's the first cross-country event, an obstacle course that involves a lot more in the way of jumping and avoiding traps, a regular old-fashioned beatdown where you either knock out your opponent or throw them off the edge, and another beatdown type event where you've got to climb up a pole and punch a ball open before the others. Naturally, most of these events aren't just focused on winning. You also get points for fighting as much as possible on the way, successfully knocking down your opponents or chucking weapons at them in a style that's quite similar to how you'd play Niketsu's story. If you don't get enough points to qualify for the next event, then it's game over, so you probably shouldn't just be focused on finishing in first place during the races. After all, the races all happen in short segments where you'll be all close to each other at the start of the next, even if you get ridiculously far behind in the previous bit. So yes, you should really just be fighting and causing an interference as much as possible. You do get points for where you finish in each of the segments too, mind you, so there is a bit of a balance. The PC Engine CD version of the game is laid out much the same as the Famicom version, complete with the expected souped-up graphics, voiceovers and a Red Book soundtrack, but you also do have the option of being able to practice the events here, which certainly comes in handy.
The Game Boy version does differ a fair bit from the other two. Not only is it perhaps a bit more forgiving, but it actually features five events as opposed to four. The Game Boy version removes the ball breaking event, but adds in two other beatdown events, one where the first athlete to successfully eat a baguette wins, and a bomb tag where the poor sod who's left in charge of the bomb when the time runs out loses. One of the other things you've got to figure out in this game is choosing your team members. The temptation is, of course, to pick Kunio in every event. He is, after all, by far the strongest athlete of the lot. However, he doesn't recover as quickly as other members in your team do, so while he can certainly take a beating, you may want to choose someone else for an event if Kunio takes a little too much punishment. Again, it doesn't necessarily matter too much, you can just choose Kunio for everything if you're proficient enough, although it does show one of the great things about most Kunio games in that, for an 8-bit game, almost every character is wholly individual and named, with not many clones kicking about. That's not something you often saw in games from this generation, it has to be said. Niketsu March is still entertaining on the whole, even if I am admittedly really not that good at it. I would say that I prefer this first one to the sequel, which we'll be looking at later on. You will note that this video, for once on this channel, is very much a Famicom loving, and for pretty good reason. Kunio and the Famicom absolutely go hand in hand, with Technos releasing Kunio games on the system very nearly to the end of its commercial life in Japan. The next game is one that only came out for the Famicom and did so in February of 1992, Ike Ike Niketsu Hockey Bull Subet Kawand Dawanto, or Go Go Niketsu Hockey Club Slip and Slide Madness, takes us to the land of pucks, body checks and five for fighting. It's ice hockey. It is kind of surprising that this is the only Niketsu ice hockey game, really. You would have thought that, after dodgeball, this would be the most suitable sport for our hot-blooded hero. But there you go. Today, Kunio gets into an argument with Yoichi, captain of the school ice hockey team, after twatting him in the face with a ball. This is a very common form of introduction in Niketsu High School's yard. From this, he learns that the team will be disbanded if they lose an upcoming game to rivals Shirogane, and naturally he's asked to help because, well, he's Kunio, kin of all rough and ready jocks and up for anything. After his dodgeball club absolutely rout the hockey club in the first match, they take over proceedings and Yoichi joins up with them. This game could have potentially got a localization at one stage. The American win of Technos announced that they were going to release a bunch of Kunio games under the banner of Crash and the Boys, including this one which would have been called Crash and the Boys Ice Challenge, along with athletics, soccer and basketball games that we're yet to get to. Alas, in the end only the athletics title came out internationally. A prototype of the localised Ice Challenge does exist, although apparently almost nothing about it has been changed from the original. There will be a bit more detail when we get to the second athletics game. Anyway, as for this game itself, well it is exactly what you would expect a Niketsu high based ice hockey game to be like, and that is a very good thing. You don't just play as Kunio this time, with controls switching between team members depending on who's closest to the action, and you can also change your team members for each period. Something else that's new here is that once you beat another team, you can also change to their uniform. For instance, you can dress as the Kendo team after beating them, and changing to a new uniform offers stat increases as well as special abilities. Naturally, teams have super shots at their disposal too, the rink that you're playing in can also have its own quirks, and because this is a hockey game you're also in charge of the goalie, a la Blades of Steel. And because this is a Kunio game, you naturally shouldn't just focus on scoring goals, you're going to want to beat up the other guys a lot. However, there is a little semblance of walls. If you subject one particular opponent to too much of a beating, it is possible to incur a penalty and be sent to the sin bin. Also, characters can get enraged if they're beaten up too much, making them more violent and buffing their stats for a short time. The differences between the characters is much more marked here than it has been in previous Niketsu sports titles. Every person on your team now has their own set of numbers for power, speed and weight, as well as their level of proficiency in goal. 
All of Naketsu's team also has their own special shots such as Kunio's signature nuts or Yoichi's dejected, while the opponents also differ in various ways, such as the Kendo team using a shockwave attack or Yoko's girls hockey club being able to morph the ball into a rampaging teddy bear. In case you can't tell, this game is kind of chaotic. It may well be easy to score so long as you get into the right position, but you're most certainly going to have to fight like hell and deal with lord knows what else in order to get there. It is most certainly a jolly good laugh, perhaps not quite on the level of a damn near perfect game like Blades of Steel, but it's certainly an excellent alternative that really focuses on the most entertaining things about ice hockey such as the slashing, late hitting, and the knocking of a goalie into the cheap seats with a slap shot. Just a few months later, the next Kunio sports game would arrive, and it's the second athletics title. Bikui Niketsu Shinkoku Haokunaru Kin Medal hit the shelves in June of 1992, with a Game Boy version coming the following year, and this one translates to, surprise, Niketsu New Records, the distant gold medal. However, this one would be localised and released internationally under the name Crash and the Boys Street Challenge, the first game in what was supposed to be a line of titles for the NES that even teases the upcoming Ice Challenge at the ending, but due to poor sales, this was the only game in the proposed series to come out in the West. Our hero's story continues when he's invited to another athletic meet by Todo, who gives a sob story to his oil president father Konosuke so that he can help him out. Konosuke does so by bringing a team of American athletes from Oklahoma into the meet, who will be lining up alongside Niketsu as well as the usual suspects Hanzono, Reho and the Interschool Union. In the Western version, Kunio is replaced with Jeff Crash Cooney, the much admired super jock of Southside High School, while Toddo is replaced by Theodore Thornley IV, leader of Washington High. The plot of the game itself is pretty similar to the original, mind you. Once again, I have to confess that I'm pretty terrible at this game. Although Distant Gold Medal is a bit more forgiving in that you can practice the events before embarking on the full meet, and the game doesn't automatically end if you do badly at one of them. There are now five different events available, a 400 meter hurdles where you'll punch and kick at your enemy while trying your best to either jump over or run through the barriers, a rather fun one that mixes the hammer throw with golf, a swimming event where you stroke your way through the city's canal while trying to keep your opponent under the water, a spot of rooftop jumping with the help of pole vaults and unicycles, and finally a straight fight with someone from the other team. The events are generally quite amusing, even if they are also hard. I mean, I don't know, I don't think I'm too bad when it comes to most of the other Niketsu sports games, but I really struggle with these athletic ones. I think the fighting one is quite interesting. The way it plays with punches, kicks and grappling thanks to a stamina meter is actually more like a wrestling game, meaning this is the closest thing there is to having one of Technos' brilliant WWF arcade titles on the NES. Still, my favourite events are probably the hammer throw golf and the rooftop jumping. I may be terrible at all of them, but I get the biggest kick out of these. It is a shame that the western version of the game didn't do any better sales-wise, dooming the chances of there being other Crash and the Boys games. However, this didn't come out until October of 1992, which was perhaps too late for any new NES title to be a big seller. The name did achieve immortality in another way, mind you. It's heavily referenced in the Scott Pilgrim vs The World comic, film and game, where one of the bands is named Crash and the Boys. So there you go. The Game Boy version of the title came out in 1993, and this one didn't leave Japan. Again, this is a perfectly decent port that plays near enough exactly like the Famicom game, so you'll have a good time on handhelds if this title is up your street. There is one significant difference. The swimming event has been replaced by a somewhat similar free-falling event where you and an opposing team member jump off a building and fight for control of an umbrella that will land you safely on the ground, but the fight could end before then if you beat the other opponent up enough. Or, if you're me, the fight will end before then because the opponent's beaten the proverbial seven shades out of me. 
Much like Super Awesome Field Day, you can also choose individual characters to play as in these games. Kunio is, again, the strongest, but perhaps shouldn't be deployed willy-nilly. Another addition to Distant Gold Medal that can help out is going to a shop before an event. It's important to pick up and win medals during the events, which can then be used in the shop to buy various power-ups, stat buffers and special techniques. This isn't my favourite of the Niketsu sports games by any stretch, but it's a fun take on the age-old track and field formula. It's time for another sequel, the second and final football game in the Kunio line, Kunio Kun no Niketsu Soccer League, or Kunio Kun's Niketsu Soccer League. This title never left Japan and was released on the Famicom only in April of 1993, which is, again, a shame if expected. There's not much new in the way of plot here. This simply follows on from the events of the first soccer game, with the soccer club now being sent on a world tournament. Unfortunately, Coach Misako can't accompany the team on this journey, but she does promise again to give them all a big smooch if they win. This takes on a slightly different form to the original. Rather than it being a straight knockout format, it's a league where you play each team multiple times, although you can choose the fixture that you want to play next. The core gameplay of Soccer League is very similar to the original in that you only play as Kunio, you shout commands to the other players, and super shots are quite important when it comes to hitting the back of the net, but there's a lot more additions to Soccer League and it's most certainly superior to the original. The management and tactical side of the game has definitely been beefed up. You can call meetings and give gifts to your teammates, for a start. This can definitely help out when it comes to stat and confidence boosts, although you have to figure out which gift is most suitable for which player. Tactical choices do have more of an impact now, especially because the AI of your team is much improved. They're not as predictable, nor will they always just follow your commands like an automaton, which is a bit more realistic. Along with different pitches, weather can also play a heavy factor. You can get some rather extreme conditions out there, and this makes everything even more amusingly chaotic. I must say that, yeah, this game is quite excellent. Perhaps even the best football game available for the system. While that's not exactly a deep field, I'm pretty confident that this is far superior to any other footy game available on the NES or Famicom. A great update to an already pretty good football game, particularly with the surprisingly hefty amount of depth that it offers. Highly recommended. We still have one more Kunio sports game on the original Famicom, but the next game in the timeline actually takes us to 16-bit land. We're off to the Super Famicom for a sequel that you may well have expected to see. It is not too surprising that Kunio Kun's first sporty outing on this system would take him back to his original love. Once again, it's time for Dodgeball. Kunio Kun no Dodgeball Daio Zenin Shugo came out in August of 93, and the title translates to It's Kunio's Dodgeball, Assemble Everyone, although apparently it's usually just called SFC Dodge by those who know the game well. With the whole Niketsu universe having undergone a rather large expansion since the days of the original Super Dodgeball, this new game features a whole load of characters from the downtown world. Indeed, there's actually a rather intimidating amount of depth to this game, which should become clear as soon as you encounter these surprisingly huge menus. SFC Dodge is a lot more simulator-like than its arcade predecessor, that's for sure. You can create your own teams, players, competitions, all sorts. Navigating the menus without a translation is something akin to an absolute nightmare, and I haven't managed to get any of the patches kicking around to work on my setup, which is a shame. By all accounts, there's a lot of rewarding stuff to be found. For a change, this is a Kunio game where you can build your own team completely from scratch, with your characters getting better on every match and all sorts. A real proper dodgeball journey. But there is one big problem. The actual dodgeball game is, unfortunately, pretty low quality. It's way too jerky and slow, and the controls are much less responsive than they were in the original, even less responsive than they are on the NES port. 
Honestly, for all the quality there is in the customization and being able to do damn near anything you can imagine when it comes to the venerable sport of dodgeball, the actual game just really lets things down. A damn shame, really. If the game actually played better, then this could have really been something special. As it is, we do still have another bout of dodgeball to go before the videos end. Before that, we've got to add another arrow of sporting greatness to Cuneo's quiver. It's a whole new ball game, and this time, it's basketball. The Ketsu Street Basket Ganbare Dunk Heroes, or All Out Dunk Heroes, is the final Kunio Kun game to be released for the original Famicom. It came out as late as December of 93, and after a generally fantastic one of games for this almighty system, I am happy to say that this one finishes Finns on a high. The plot here is even wilder than usual. Kunio wins a quiz show that comes with a ticket to the States as the prize, and he intends to go and visit Johnny, ace of the Oklahoma track team that was introduced in Distant Gold Medal. However, Ricky and Godai, fellow top delinquents of Hanzonu and Tanibana schools respectively, decide to accompany Kunio on his journey by strapping themselves to the wheel of the frickin' plane. When everyone finally comes together on American soil, they decide to enter a street basketball tournament that takes place all over the country. Just another regular day in the life of Niketsu's finest, isn't it? Dunk Heroes continues the well-established and enduring theme of all the other 8-bit Kunio sports affairs. This sure is sport, but it's not as you know it. In fact, this might be the wildest one of them all. It's two-on-two -two action, kind of similar to NBA Jam in that you play as one guy and the other is computer controlled. If you don't have the ball, naturally fighting is going to be the order of the day. It is certainly easier to steal a ball when you can perform a rush kick directly into an opponent's breadbasket, although they're more than prepared to strike back. The scoring system is even wilder. There isn't just one basket on each side, there's three of them, positioned at different heights. Ideally, you want to aim for the top basket. It's quite possible to throw a ball that'll go through all three baskets, resulting in nine points, and generally this happens when you nail a super shot. With everyone having their usual abilities, the courts also having their usual quirks and the speed of the whole thing, this all becomes a load of casual fun, a really great party game. It's the sort of game where it's actually quite easy to score against yourself if you're getting too frazzled by the pace of the action, but that's kind of intentional because it's not like you're supposed to take the whole thing seriously. In short, yeah, this one's terrific. One of the very best Cuneo sports games, possibly the best basketball game on the whole system, even over double dribble, and a great way for our hot-blooded street tough to finish things up on the Famicom. Absolutely one of the games from this vid you should play now if you haven't. Following Kunio Kun's first rather disappointing Super Famicom sports outing, he's here once again with another new sport. And I must say, considering how this is by far the most popular sport in all of Japan, it is absolutely crazy that it's taken this long for Kunio to finally get a baseball game. Downtown Niketsu Baseball Monogatari Yaku Dishobu Da Kunio Kun is the name of the title, which translates to Downtown Hot Blooded Baseball Story It's a Baseball Match Kunio Kun. Yes, the titles only ever get stranger. Frustratingly, this is one of the more obscure entries in the whole canon. There's no translation for this one, and very little info kicking around compared to the other games. However, this title does allow somebody else to take the spotlight. Sugata is the new captain of Niketsu's baseball team, another fiery student who considers Kunio his senpai. With old captain Tachibana suffering an injury and disbanding the old team, Sugata gets the band back together and attempts to win the tournament, for there is always a tournament, with the hope of winning the heart of Rika, the old baseball team's somewhat sickly manager. Kunio, meanwhile, is generally not available and off one in various errands, although he will make the odd appearance here and there. Generally, I struggle a lot with baseball games, and while this is hardly an exception, it's not exactly offensive. 
You do get a lot of options when it comes to pitchers and batting, including the obligatory super shots. Zugata certainly has a pretty mean fastball, although obviously you can't just use these willy-nilly seeing as there's a meter that'll go down any time you use one of the special pitchers. Other than that, well, generally, this is baseball, although it is a baseball game that comes with a decent presentation. It doesn't have the usual chaos of a Niketsu sports title, being a bit more conventional in the end, although I do imagine that as this game goes on, the pitchers and swings get more outlandish than your average change-ups and curveballs. Certainly not one of the essential titles in the world of Kunio, but it's not all that offensive. It's just baseball. The next game, our second to last title, is possibly the most obscure one of the lot, Neketsu Beach Volley Dayo Kunio-kun, or Hot-Blooded, It's Kunio's Beach Volleyball, came out in July 94 for the Game Boy, only in Japan. It's yet another new sport for the series and, eh, there's not a lot to say about the plot for once. Satomi, Neketsu's cheerleader, tells Kunio about a beach volleyball tournament and Kunio naturally decides to take part alongside his best friend Ricky. Simple as. To be honest, there's not much to say about the game either. This is probably the weakest entry in the whole canon for me. Partly because I'm not all that big on volleyball games as is, but it also seems a bit lacking in most departments. I think the trouble with this title, really, is that it's all a bit too basic and kind of lacking in one of the big things that makes Kunio games stand out. That being the violence, the hilariously slapstick punching, biting and kicking that truly makes Kunio what it is. This seems to be far more conventional even than the baseball game that we've just featured. It's just, well, it's beach volleyball, and that's kind of it. I can't really recommend this one at all, I'm afraid. So, here's the last game in the video. Kunio no Neketsu Dodgeball Densetsu, or Kunio's Hot-Blooded Dodgeball Legend, was released in 1996. Not only is it the last Kunio sports game by Technos Japan, it's the last Kunio game full stop. In fact, it's the last game the studio would ever make, for reasons we'll get into. And it takes us back to where it all began. We're in the arcades again, and it's a game that in the US is simply known as Super Dodgeball. This time around, the game is published by SNK and uses their Neo Geo MVS system, and it never officially came out in Japan. It was tested in the territory but never fully released, and it only had a limited release in America on the MVS, which again makes this final Technos Kunio game a little bit obscure. We do have a plot once again, although it only really comes into play once you beat the game's final boss, D.B. Mayor, a once legendary dodgeball player who now wishes to destroy the sport completely after causing an accident that resulted in the loss of his wife. Something a little bit darker than the norm for Kunio-kun on this final go-round, although most of the other teams are the usual mix of nerds, jocks and other assorted weirdness. And also, with this being an arcade game, you aren't just limited to picking Kunio's Niketsu team. Now, it should be noted that some believe that the final boss has too much of a resemblance to Shoko Asahara, leader of the Yamashinriko Doomsday Cult, and this is why the game was never released in Japan. However, this has utterly never been confirmed. The aim of the game is, of course, just like the original. Hit that opposing team as hard as you can until there's none of them left. However, there's a lot more added to the game now than just highly souped up graphics. The usual basics of catching balls coming at you, passing, running that ball in and throwing it as hard as you can do remain, but you're definitely going to have to get to grips with the advanced techniques if you want to get far here. Most of the special moves are now performed using classic fighting game button combinations. For example, a quarter circle Hadouken type motion will perform the captain's special throw, while a Shoryuken motion can either perform a teammate's special move or, if you're defending, a crushing counter-attack that is very handy indeed to learn. You've got a power bar that gradually fills with each successful attack or counter, and once you max it out a half circle motion performed by the captain will do the team's top combination attack, pulverising just about anyone on the other side. 
Learning these moves is definitely the key to victory, especially as you get further into the game and the other teams start to use these techniques with impunity. The power bar can also be filled up through successful taunting and charging. A big part of the game really is racing to get that filled up as quickly as possible before the other team gets there. <laughs> In the end, Dodgeball Legend is a pretty worthy update of the original title. The graphics have still managed to retain that charm, the scope of the gameplay was successfully widened with all the new techniques and the ability to recruit opposing teams' captains once they're beaten, and it is definitely the best Kunio sports game by some distance outside of the series' traditional 8-bit surroundings. However, this game would sadly be the end for Technos Japan. Shortly after the game's release, the company declared bankruptcy. It appears as though Technos were one of the main video game companies to fall victim to Japan's Great Recession in the 1990s. Real estate acquisitions were one of the main causes of their cash flow problems, and this, combined with the need to expand in the second half of the 90s for the new generation, would eventually be too much for them, as was the case with various other smaller studios around the world. While Technos never experienced much in the way of a decline, with the large majority of the games that they released very much being quality, it was a sudden and surprising end for Technos and for their mascot Kunioken. Happily, a few years later, Technos' assets would be acquired by Million Corporation and Atlas Japan. Initially, this resulted in compilations of Kunio games for platforms like the Game Boy Advance, and eventually fully-fledged all-new Kunio titles would start coming out, including some sports ones. Nowadays, the Kunio series is back in rude health thanks to the exploits of Arc System Works, some of the most celebrated beat-em-ups of the last few years, games such as River City Ransom Underground and River City Girls, have come out under the Kunio banner. There's also been a few sports titles to shout about through this new era for the franchise, but it is perhaps best to draw a little line here and look at these another time perhaps. Technos' Kunio sports line is a very interesting one of games. There's a lot more of them than you think, and it's certainly one of the more intriguing approaches that a studio has had towards building a mascot, taking him out of the beat-em-up where he originally made his name, and putting him in all sorts of different and ever crazier situations, complete with a whole load of humour and tons of fun. Most of these games are absolutely worth playing, and hopefully you find something cool out of this that you've not looked at previously. In any case, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and until the next time, bye for now.